Now we'll give you a quick tour of the secondary functions tables here. And this is basically going to be derived the same way that we did with the primary functions. You're going to get this from your ballistic software. And the basic overview of secondary functions are a bunch of extra information that's not critical need to know information usually, but could become very handy in certain circumstances. And uh, when we get out in the field and start using these things more, I will you will see examples of where these would be handy. So I'll just give you a quick tour. And this is a relatively simple one to do. So you're going to pick out your template again based on your optical configuration. In this case, a mill dot reticle with minute of angle turrets. You're also going to base it on your designated standards. For us, it was a 50 BMG 750 grain AMAX bullet at these conditions here. And then you're going to use your ballistic software to calculate these different outputs, okay? At these different ranges. So here we have our super elevation. And this is going to be the same as in our primary functions tables. This is what we're actually indexing on the optic, minutes of angle in this case. If you have a mill, mill scope, then this would be in mills. Now in this case, on the secondary uh, functions, is sometimes you are going to want to know the other unit of measurement. Perhaps someone else has a rifle using the same ammunition as you and they're going to want a general idea of where they're going to have to adjust. Maybe they're in mills. Or maybe someone's going to, uh, maybe you're going to apply holdover. Uh, that could be a possibility as well. And because if you look at this, this was a mill dot reticle, but minute of angle turrets. For primary use, you're going to index your elevation on minutes of angle. But there may be instances where you might just want to adjust in mills by holdover. So this is going to have both your minutes and your mills of holdover here. So that's a secondary function that's possible you might want to employ mills. And then we also have a bullet drop section. And this is something you generate in your ballistic software. Make sure your designated standards are exactly the same as everything else. But you're going to have your bullet drop not only in minutes, but you might want to know what it is in inches for close ranges. Okay, you want this is just information that might be handy to know in the field or feet. That way, if something goes goofy, or if you miss by a certain amount, you're going to be able to use this for a process of elimination and intelligently uh, diagnose your problem. So, for example, at 1,000 meters, you can know that you're going to have about 23 feet of drop at 1,000. And at uh, 200, uh, 2,500 meters, you're going to have 255 feet of drop. That's a lot. This gives you a basic comprehension of the ballistic character of your load and your rifle. Maximum ordnance. Maximum ordnance is when you fire your bullet, it's going to go way up through the ascending branch. It's going to hit out the, the highest point in the trajectory is the max ordnance, and it's going to descend. Knowing where this is is going to be uh, very important for in several different ways. The first way is you're going to need to focus in on your maximum ordnance with your spotter to basically get a wind reading at the max ordnance because your bullet is going to be flying up in the air and it's going to be higher above the ground and your wind is going to be different higher above the ground than it is right at ground level. So when you're getting your uh, mid-range wind reading that you're going to average out with the other ones, you're going to want to get it at your max ordinance. You're going to have to know where that is. Let's say you're shooting at a thousand meters, okay? You're going to say, okay, so at a thousand meters, your maximum ordinance is going to occur at 525 meters. That is 53% of the way to the target. And the, the height of the ordnance is going to be 90 inches, 90.6 inches, which also translate in terms of feet. You're going to want to have different increments because people in lower inches, you're going to be able to understand that. But once you get over 70 inches, and that's why I have the number smaller here past 100, is you're not going to be able to really, you're not going to know what 172 inches looks like just looking for your optic, okay? And in smaller inches, you will. And then it has in feet as well. Because you're going to be able to think, okay, 20 feet, you're going to visualize that just by looking through your scope. And you're going to have a, a basic idea of where to focus in on the wind or the mirage, okay? And then we have the percentage of the drop. So at 1,000 meters, this max ordnance is going to be 33% of the drop. And that's also just all in there. It's just extra information that's going to give you a basic ballistic profile so you can understand what you're looking at. Another instance where maximum ordnance could be very important. If you're shooting in a forest or in urban environments, let's say your target is kind of behind a bridge but below the bridge, okay? Um, 
Your flight path of the bullet could intersect objects on the way to the target. If you're shooting in a forest, you might be shooting underneath a tree. Uh, there might be a tree mid-range. The target is totally visible in a straight line of sight. However, there is a tree somewhere above, or you might have power lines uh, above going someplace through your bullet path. So you're going to want to know, okay, you can range, for example, let's say a bridge. Is your bullet going to hit the bridge coming down into the target? Even though you can see it clearly, that might be where the path of the bullet is. So you can say, okay, we're shooting at 1,500 meters. Uh, the max ordnance is going to occur at 750 meters. So if the bridge is there and it is uh, 17 feet high, well, crap, you're not going to hit the target. You're going to hit the bridge, right? So knowing where your max ordnance is, is going to be, a, actually, it could become a primary function for certain applications. So that's very important. You need to know information in certain applications. And when you're judging your wind, it's going to be important. And there's other things that this will be important for, too, as well. All right, so how do we figure out these max ordnance values? Well, we're going to copy and paste them from ballistic software. And this is something that some ballistic software programs may feature and others may not. So I'm going to show you the fail-safe way of getting this, no matter what kind of software you're using. Here, we're just going to look at JBM Ballistics Online, free software that's real good. I'm going to go down here and we're going to click the old trajectory tab. Okay. Now you're going to enter in all your data and you want to make sure that it's matching your designated standards like we talked about earlier. Okay. That's going to be very important. You got to get that correct. And then what we're going to do is uh, rather than having your zero range, which should normally be right around 100 meters or so, um, we're going to change this to whatever our max, we're, we're looking for our max ordnance range to be. So in this case, we'll put in a thousand meters for our zero range, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to watch the uh, the bullet trajectory and see where it's at its highest point beyond that, okay? And range increments, um, normally these might be listed in hundred meter increments, but in this case, we're just going to go in real fine increments. So I'm going to put in just five meter increments and we can get a real close... Uh, look at where exactly that max ordnance is going to fall. Make sure all your other inputs are correct. Uh, I did select my range in meters down here, okay? And then I'm going to go down to the bottom and click the old calculate tab, okay? Okay, so it's going to shoot out your raw data at you here, okay? And if you look in our columns that we're going to be looking at, here's our range column. This is the distance, okay? And, um, this here is our drop in minutes of angle and our drop in inches. We're going to look at our drop value in inches. Okay, So as you can see here, as we get farther out, the, the bullet is going higher and higher above the line of sight. Here we have, um, okay, so out here at 445, it's 115 inches above the line of sight. We're going to watch where it goes to its highest point, but then starts coming back down again. Okay, and we're, oh, here we go, right here in the 119s, oh, 120s, that's pretty high. Okay, so it's right in here. 120, all right. So I'd say it's right in the middle here. So it's going to be probably one, um, 120 inches is going to be the, the height of your max ordnance at about 543 meters or so. So that's the data right there that you would grab. And then you could uh, cut and paste this information or type this into your sheet. And uh, you would simply just uh, put in your your distance, okay, that it was at for a thousand meters, because we had our zero set up for a thousand meters, so five forty-five or whatever. And then you would uh, put in your height in inches, and then you can convert your inches into feet. So you're gonna have to. You could use Excel to do that, or you can just use your calculator. But it's really not that hard to find max ordnance. And uh, for each range you have over here on your paper you're going to have to type in the, that new range in the zero column on your ballistic software and look for that highest point. And that's how you can get your max ordnance. It's a little bit tedious doing it this way, but that is uh, probably the, the best way to actually get a hold of it, no matter what kind of software you're using. Some might just have a button that calculates it for you. If so, fantastic. Next thing we're going to look at here is your remaining velocity and remaining energy. And that's another thing you're going to find right in your JBM ballistics tables here. And uh, you're going to have your Mach number, your, that's your speed of sound. You're going to have your energy and foot-pounds. You can change this stuff if you'd like. And your velocity. So that's simply going to be a cut and paste type deal. Now it's true that these things are going to change okay, as your other variables change. As your other primary functions change, your climatic conditions 
for example, your remaining velocity is not going to be the same at 100 degrees as it is going to be at uh, 50 degrees, okay? So, but this is giving you a general representation of what kind of velocity you can expect at this distance, likewise with energy. And these are going to be important for um, many various applications of fire. And you'll see as you get more experience out in the field how these are going to be handy to know. This is going to give you your basic power, uh, how hard it's going to hit if it's going to be able to take out the target. This is going to be handy for things like lead or for if you got an animate target that's moving erratically. There's going to be some uh, factors you're going to want to account into that. Uh, likewise with your time of flight, that's going to be important for lead as well. Okay. And uh, that's another thing you can get straight from JBM Ballistics is it's going to have a time of flight in there. Flight time in seconds it has right there. See it? Flight time in seconds. Okay, and then, so that's another thing you're going to want to have. It's going to be a cut and paste. And then you're going to have your wind deflection also given to you in different units than you would normally have, your inches and your feet, just to give you a, a ballistic character of what's going on. So you can think in terms of feet as well. Danger space. What's that? This is going to be very important, and we'll probably do a video on this, but this is basically how much wiggle room you have uh, at the whatever distance column you're looking at. So at 1,000 meters, you have a danger space of 986 to 1014. That basically means that you have to accurately calculate your distance to the target within these parameters. So if you miscalculate, your, if the target is actually at 1,000 meters and you don't get within these numbers, for your, you're going to miss the target. And this is the size of your target. For a 5-inch target, that, that a failure to range the target within these accuracy parameters is going to make you miss this size of a target. And there's actually a feature on JBM Ballistics to calculate danger space. It's a box you check, and it will actually give that information to you. And then you can cut and paste all this in there. So that's pretty handy. You used to have to do a lot of thinking to figure that out, but JBM Ballistics did do something pretty cool there. So this is going to be very important. Uh, this is going to help you determine basically how precise your ranging has to be in order to hit... Uh, your given target, okay? And a 5-inch target radius is uh, a pretty typical target for the vitals on most things, okay? That's a 10-inch wide target totally. So at uh, 2,000 meters, you can notice the farther out you get, the more uh, descending of an angle you have on your trajectory of your bullet. So if you misrange your target, even by a tiny bit from 1996 to 2004 meters, you only have like, what, 8? <laughs> You only have like eight uh, meters of wiggle room, and if you get it wrong, you're going to miss. So this is telling you that you're going to have to use a laser or GPS or a theodolite. Uh, you're going to have to probably use a theodolite to actually get a for sure actual surveyed uh, measurement of the target distance in order to hit a five-inch target. Okay, because that's going to be your that's what danger space is, and we'll explain that more in uh, depth later. So there's nothing really in the secondary functions sheet that you're going to use, probably in your calc forms, but you are going to use this for other different things as far as mission planning um, and other, other uh, considerations as far as your target and how fast it might be moving or uh, how thick it might be, how much energy you're going to need to take your target down, uh, if you got obstructions, things like that. So these are very, very handy to have in the field. Uh, so this is a very valuable piece of paper to have. This is absolutely critical, your primary functions. And then this is going to help you paste it all together. So that's the happy family we have there. We have our calc form, our primary functions. These are pretty much married. And then we have the baby, which is the secondary function. That's going to help you out. And then if you're a scientist type guy and you're going to be smart about it, you're going to keep track of your actual observed muzzle velocities so that you can know when to tweak this stuff. <laughs> so that's kind of a mouthful. I know that's a lot of stuff. You guys are sharp. I'm sure you will figure it out. If you've gotten this far, if you have this much patience, you'll figure it out no problem. We're going to do more real-world type situations. We showed you on paper last time. Um, uh, a, a firing solution or a, a mission, a fire mission that you would encounter on the field, but we'll do lots more of this in real life and uh, when we get into our, our range oriented videos. And that's going to be fun. And I'll show you how to use this and you'll get the hang of it. But this is an excellent tool to have in your tackle box. 
is understanding these ballistic relationships and being able to do it with a pencil. Because I'm telling you, if you're a lot of guys who are into this shooting discipline are anticipating that they might need it for certain situations that are less than happy. And in those instances, you're not going to be able to recharge your iPhone. So that's going to be out. Your ballistic computer is going to fail you eventually, or you're going to run out of batteries. So that's out. Uh, there are some analog ballistic calculators that are excellent. Um, those are not too bad. And this is a, a system that we worked out for extreme long-range precision shooting that is very accurate. I've used this to make incredible hits. Um, most of them were not ever captured on video before I started filming anything. But I can tell you and verify that this system does work incredibly well. I mean, you can nail you know, beer cans or whatever, or you can nail prairie dogs at a thousand meters or whatever you're shooting at, or uh, paper targets. You can do incredible things if you keep track of everything properly. So hopefully this gets you the ability to actually think through what's going on. Uh, if you're just typing it into a computer, that'll work until the poop hits the fan and then you're gonna be kind of screwed because you're not gonna actually have a legitimate understanding of these ballistic relationships unless you wrestle through trying to think it out, marking it down, doing the math calculations, and actually using your brain to figure this stuff out. This is gonna be completely superior uh, in a real life scenario where, and also for problem shooting type applications, your computer could spit a crazy number at you and if you're not used to doing this, you're not going to be able to troubleshoot why it gave you a goofy number. You're not going to know which input was wrong. You're not going to know why the output is acting goofy. So this is very, very, very critical in my opinion to understand if you want to do extreme long-range precision shooting. There is another way of doing this, and that's just take a couple shots. And we'll show you how to do that too. There are different... Uh, disciplines of fire which enable you to make a second round hit okay now this is for first round hits you want to get you have to figure out everything in advance to get it good but if you want to do a second round hit all you do is you get kind of close with whatever you know you're you don't even need any of this stuff you just get you, you send off around you watch where your impact is or you watch where your trace went and then you just adjust fire and you should be able to get right on target on your second round that's okay for a lot of purposes, for target practice, for steel target shooting, for paper target shooting, that might work fine. But in real life, your target is not going to stand there after a bullet whizzes past it. Unless you're real far away, sometimes a deer is kind of stupid, it'll stand there. Or uh, certain animals or other critters might be kind of stupid and stand there for you. But usually, once a critter understands that it's under fire, it's not standing there anymore. And if it's anything that's even medium or long range you're not going to be able to take a shot on an erratically moving target with any kind of degree of confidence that you're actually going to hit it. So first round hits are very important. So certain applications like uh, some of the horse reticles and even the holdover methods uh, that a lot of guys like to use for competition shooting are great. And in certain combat applications, that might be okay. But for classic sniper applications or for long range hunting where you only have one shot, this is going to be the way to go. You're not going to just rely on your second shot because the target's probably not going to be there. So that's my soapbox issue for the moment. And uh, now that we have this difficult, terrible, boring stuff behind us, um, I'm just going to dive right in and show you actually how to use all this stuff when we get out in the field, okay? So this was uh, just crunching through the painful stuff. We're going to go out in the field. We're going to start learning our marksmanship skills. A lot in these videos are going to be a lot easier to pump out more quickly for you guys. And we are just going to learn by getting thrown into the mix. We're going to just use this stuff as we would actually need it in the field. There's no more uh, super detailed classroom stuff that we really need to go over in excruciating detail beyond this point. So look forward to some more range videos. This is going to be... Uh, picking up the pace quite a bit. Hopefully we can knock a bunch more out for you guys and wrap up the 101 series finally. Hang in there. All right, let's get out of here.